a lot of different ways that I've approached Palm Sunday over the years. Uh, if you've pastored for 30 years, you've had kind of 30 opportunities to, uh, to do uh, the Easter season. And, uh, and honestly, there have been some times that I've actually kind of, in a sense, ignored Palm Sunday. Not in a sense of ignored that it existed or it did, but not focused on that as, uh, as, as necessarily doing a lesson related to it. And, uh, and, and a variety of reasons for that might have been the series we were in at that time or feeling like that sometimes people glaze over a little bit, come to this and just sort of glaze over the story. It happens to be one of the stories that if we'd have been exposed at all to church over the years that we probably are familiar with. And even oftentimes it's uh, the story, one of the stories of the Bible uh, that, that even people who do not go to church on an often basis will come maybe during the Easter season or uh, or say at Christmas time in particular. And so these are stories that are kind of familiar with a lot of people. And because of the familiarity, sometimes they can lose some of its effect on us, not because the story isn't effective, but because we've kind of become so used to the story. And, um, and so we feel like we know it. There's maybe not much else we can learn from it. As I've looked at this passage throughout uh, this past week in particular, uh, zeroing in on what we're going to say, and remembering certainly, of course, that we're in this series that we're calling the call, uh, and and trying to stay on task with that, but at the same time to honor this story as it's given in the scripture related to the celebration that takes place today, what we call Palm Sunday, and so what I've decided to do is to merge the two together because it works. Um, the, the, the call that we've been talking about, the things that we're engaged to, and the things that I really wanted to say today are reflected in this story. And so, um, so it may be a different application than you've ever heard from it before, but hopefully if that's the case, then maybe it's a fresh uh, way of looking at this story or a fresh way of learning some lessons from the story. And on your sheet beside you, if you'll grab that up uh, beside you uh, in, in your handout, uh, on the um, portion where it says scriptures, we're going to walk our way through that, but we're going to walk our way through it as we go through the outline. So before we dive into that, let me uh, have you look at the memory verse. And uh, the memory verse is reflective of kind of the celebration that took place. In other words, uh, the reason I chose this memory verse is because... Of the, of, the, of the kind of the message of it as it relates to uh, Holy Week. It says, the Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. Let the God of my salvation be exalted. And there are many things that as believers that we are called to do. But one of the most significant things that we are called to do as believers is to glorify God's name. Is to you know, some of the new songs maybe use the term, make him famous. Now, I, you know, I, I don't know in a sense that we have the capability of making him famous because he's already widely famous um, and, and loved and hated like every other famous being that's ever existed. But, um, but the truth of the matter is that it is our job to give him appropriate honor to reflect his glory in our lives to reflect, reflect his love, his passion, his care, his concern. We are to be a, a, a light, a symbol of God's presence in the word, world. We are to help bring his kingdom to this world. We, those are responsibilities we have. And so we do that by exalting him. Let the, let the God of my salvation be exalted. And I was thinking even this morning as um, I was just having a few moments of reflection and I was thinking... I, I, I said, God, I want, I want to honor you and I want to exalt you. I use this word, exalt you. And as I said that, it dawned on me the truth of the matter is this. I cannot add to or take anything away from God. I don't have that capability. He is perfect in his being. And yet, for some reason, he is honored by my willingness to honor him. And I don't add anything to or take anything away from him by my disobedience or by my obedience or by my worship or my lack of worship. I don't, but there's still a dynamic 
that God created when he created mankind that has to do with it being very appropriate and it's something that is meaningful to God whether he needs it or not in his completeness for us to exalt him. And as I was having this little reflection going on, at first I thought I'm just detouring here. My, my brain's working. I'm just trying to exalt you, God. I just want to lift you up. I want to honor you. And all of a sudden I'm having all these other thoughts rolling in. I felt like a distraction. But actually, as it kind of came around full circle, I was thinking, I think God's trying to show me something here as well. And so uh, this past week, my wife and kids uh, went to, on Monday morning, they packed up and headed down to Florida. My wife's dad had his 80th birthday this week on Wednesday. And so they went down to help celebrate that and uh, came back uh, last night. And so um, I had to go out of town in the afternoon. And when I got back, uh, Skyler was already asleep and, uh, and Hunter had fallen asleep, but just fallen asleep. So Vanjie woke him up because he was trying to stay awake until I got there. And, uh, and so we got to embrace a little bit and just spend a couple minutes together. But I was thinking as I was riding home, because I kept getting a little more and a little more excited about seeing everybody. And, um, and I was thinking, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm Rod. I'm who I am. I'm not, this is it, the whole package. It's a, I know it's a big package, but it's, it is what it is, you know. This is it right here. This is the deal. But there's something that brings me great joy. Uh, Vanjie had said, we were talking on the road, uh, both of, and she had said, that Skylar had almost like gotten upset. She was wanting to see me so much. And, uh, and, and you know, and I, I felt a little bad about not being there when they got in because of that. But, but something inside of me felt so good that she wanted to be with me and that she did miss me, even though she was having a wonderful time. But she missed me. Now, I'm not God, but God still teaches us lessons in this parent-child relationship thing. And what God spoke to me in that moment, because in a much faster time than I can get it out of my mouth to you, this all process this morning, like in a, in a 45 second to a two minute time frame, And what I heard God whisper into my spirit, and again, I didn't hear a voice, but I'm just saying, what the truth that kind of came to my spirit from this was this. And that was, Rod, do you remember the feelings you felt as you were nearing home? And some of the things that Vanjie had said about the kids had said about missing you as they were coming home. And even a couple of times there. Do you know how that made you feel? And it's like all of a sudden I'm already getting it. God, you don't even have to finish. I know. You're saying that you have those same kinds of feelings when we exalt you. And I, I you know, you can, you know, you could say, you can say all day long, well. Hey, you know, kid's a kid, whatever, and they don't, you know, how can a little kid, you ever wondered this before when you're raising little kids? You ever wondered how a little kid can make you feel so bad sometimes? And yet, how they can make you feel so good sometimes? Have you ever wondered that? Well, again, we're not God, so we're not perfect, and we're incomplete, and so sometimes we have, we're needy in a way God's not. But still, God's father heart says, man, you don't understand it because you're not God. But when you exalt me, something really good happens. And, and, and I like it. I like it. I can exist without it. But I've chosen to embrace it and, it. and it affects my heart. Well, so I just want to tell you as you go into this week, to maybe have a little bit of an extra focus on worshiping God. And, and, you know, and I know we're like, we're at a worship service right now. Yes, you are here. We are here. And so we're going to kick it off here. And the bands helped us do that. And hopefully during this time of teaching that uh, I, I will be able to help you move that forward some. But here's what I want to encourage you. And that is this, encourage you to actually this week focus on the idea of exalting God. Not only with your words, but with your life. And we're going to talk about a couple of ways that maybe that can happen from this story. And so let's go down to the outline and uh, toward the bottom of your sheet. And uh, as you might imagine, three points is like really short for me. So you're going, wow, are we going to get out early? Well, I never promised that. 
And I will have to tell you this, that I added a fourth point after the fact. So I'm going to, you get ready, leave a little room down there at the bottom to add a fourth point, okay? Um, and, and so here we go. It's, and we're going to talk about our ability to advance the kingdom on earth works best when these components are ingrained in the very fiber of our call, the call we've been talking about that we, God has given to us as, as individuals, but also as a church to reach spiritually unresolved people and help them become fully devoted followers of Christ. When these things are at work, there's a dynamic that happens that I believe moves that toward a more effective uh, process. And so the first one is this, having a work ethic that is sacrificial. Having a work ethic that is sacrificial. From this story, if you'll go back up to the very top of the sheet or you can watch on, uh, on the PowerPoint or open your Bibles to it because we're staying right here in Luke 19. Verse 28 says this, after he had said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And I, I don't have time to go back into the things that he said, but it relates to his kingship and that kind of thing, some, some aspects of that. And so uh, if, if you, you know, get a chance this week, maybe it would be good to kind of go back and read some of what led into here. Um, verse 29, when he approached Bethage and Bethany, near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples. I want to stop there a minute. Do you remember whenever you were in elementary? Because you're stuck in one classroom most of the day in elementary, except for recess, which most brilliant kids, that's their favorite class is recess, you know. Um, anyway. I, but if the teacher ever said, I need two kids who would volunteer to take this down to the principal's office. Do, do you remember, were you like quick to volunteer or did you never want to volunteer? How was it? Quick. quick. When you're in elementary, you're quick. Yeah. Get me out of the room. I get to go do something. I'm like, get used. I feel important. I was chosen. You know, all that kind of stuff. Whatever all dynamic is involved. But we like to be called out and asked to do something special. Now, what I've noticed is as we age and become more complicated and we become more engaged, that whenever volunteers are asked for, most people sit on their hands. Like, well, I'd, it doesn't seem like to me that, you know, Joe's done anything lately or he ought to do this one. Or, you know, all, we're always volunteering other people and not ourselves. We're always thinking somebody else ought to do that. And so I'm kind of thinking just from the dynamics of the disciples as they walked with Jesus and how they always were having, I shouldn't say always, but they were frequently having this dialogue about who was the most important or that kind of thing. That probably in this moment, either these two guys felt honored, kind of like in elementary school you would, or like, hey, he chose us. Or they were thinking, what do we do? Do all the dirty work? I mean, we, you know, what, what, what do we got? You guys are doing important stuff here. Jesus performs miracles along the way. He's doing, and, and what, we're going to go get a donkey? I mean, so I don't know which it was for them, but it doesn't sound like they had an argument about it. They actually went and did it, and let's go on. Jesus said, he sent, he, he, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. Now, there, there's a lot of imagery here with regard to the the colt, uh, the, the, the donkey colt, and there's also a lot of uh, scenarios where, or, or, you know, there's some prophecy that's fulfilled in this, and if you have a study Bible at all, you can kind of look at that and see how there were prophecies foretold. This accurately fulfills those prophecies uh, regarding to Jesus as the Messiah, the one who would come to save the world, and so there's a lot of, lot of all of those dynamics in there, but the point that I want to make today with regard to this is this, that there were Two guys who were willing to roll up their sleeves and go get a donkey for Jesus just because he asked them to. And he doesn't seem like he filled in all the details. He didn't really tell them if he had prearranged it. He didn't really tell them, he didn't, tell them, he didn't give them a lot of information, just like you're going to go down there and you're going to find a donkey. I want you to untie it and get it. He didn't even say, ask the people. And if you notice in the story, the people said, hey, um, what are you doing with our donkey there? Now, if you read in the Gospel of Mark, it specifically says, because this story obviously is in the Gospels, 
it, it specifically says in the Gospel of Mark that they gave him permission. They said, yes, give you permission. So here's the scenario. They're over here and they're getting a donkey. Now, I don't know how much experience you have with donkeys, but, um, you know, they're not mules, and we know that mules have more of a tendency to be stubborn. But what I do know is this is an untrained donkey. No one's ever ridden on it before. And what I do know, because I actually had a couple of horses in my teen years, and I uh, had an uncle that had several horses, and so uh, I actually helped him train a couple and uh, learned a couple hard lessons from, from that experience. But here's what I want to tell you. When you have an untrained horse, donkey, whatever, there's generally a little bit of stubbornness involved. And, uh, and if you don't know how to handle them, you know, it, you, you, it can be kind of a big job uh, to do this. And, uh, and so here they go, but they went and did it. They did it because Jesus asked them. They did it because it was necessary. They did it because it was fulfilling. They maybe didn't even fully understand at this point. It was fulfilling a prophecy. It was, uh, was going to represent him coming as the king to Jerusalem. They went and did it. And then as we read down a little further about some of the other, you'll see that they threw their coats up on the donkey when they got at the mare. They, they, they were, the disciples were gathering around. They were praising him. They were laying some, uh, some of the, Luke doesn't say this, but some of the gospels say that they were putting the palm trees and they were putting the branches down in front of them and people were putting their coats and their cloaks. It was a red carpet deal. It was a grand entrance. It was, they, were, they were worshiping him as the king, as the Messiah. Certainly there were some there probably without doubt, that we're representing this, seeing this represented as a political takeover. This guy can perform miracles. He's coming in as our king. We're about ready to get the Roman Empire off of our backs. But there were many others who were disciples who actually maybe didn't fully understand it. They maybe even seen it as somewhat political, but they were still there worshiping. But here's the deal. This was a big event. You think about it 2,000 years later, we're still talking about it. Churches all over America, all around the world are talking about this event today. This is a big event. And here's something that I know about big events. That is, it takes a lot of hands on deck to make big events happen. We know the two disciples that were sent to get the donkey. There were other disciples who were probably even during this grand worship service having to do some crowd control, having to lead the donkey. There might even have been someone who had the scooper, you know? I mean, I'm just saying, everything in kingdom work isn't always glamorous. It isn't always something that is like, you know, it isn't always center stage. There are so many things in kingdom work. And, and, and let, me, let me just tell you, even as a pastor, even though I'm standing here at center stage right now, I want to tell you that in many given weeks, there are some times whenever I'm feeling a little bit like the scooper too. Okay. Don't think I'm going to stand up here and say that, and I mean, and tell you the story because that would be improper for me to do. But I'm just simply saying, all kingdom work and much of kingdom work is not glamorous. Jesus was being exalted in this moment, but remember, he knew what he was going into Jerusalem to fulfill and to do. He was going to lay down his life. He was entering as, as, as the prince of peace, as the savior of the world, the Messiah, the one who would lay down his life. Yes, it looked glamorous at the moment. It looked like the red carpet ordeal. But he was entering in to sacrifice his own life for our salvation. So here's what I want to say. You know, this is kind of, full, kind of completing our series on the call it takes a lot of work for even a church our size to do the things that we do. Um, I stepped in to celebrate recovery uh, for a little while last Thursday night. And uh, celebrate recovery is not dependent on me for its existence and for what it does. But it is very dependent on a number of people within this body of Christ to make it happen. It would not happen without the sacrificial effort. Right now, this morning, as the kids were dismissed, there were an awful lot of adults that went out the door with them. And what those people are doing is, in, is, is hard work. And it's, it's, it's great, it's wonderful, but it's hard work. You know, we talk about the band 
and rightfully so. And I love our band, and I love our worship. I love our the, the experience. It, it, I know these people, and they're they're worshiping and they're leading us into worship, and it's 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 wonderful. I look forward to it every week. And uh, but there's another whole set of people right up here that you can't see. Only time that we notice them is whenever I forget to turn my microphone on. Hey, Larry. Hey, Pat. Hey, what you know? Start calling out people's names, and they're not to, they're not to blame, you know. And the only thing Jeff ever does wrong is is take pictures of, of my stomach when I try to do some confessional, and don't do it now, Jeff. Okay, that's. But I mean, you know, it's like I don't. I I I trust him a lot as a person, but I don't trust him at all in this category. So anyway, but but we, you know, I I looked out my window this morning, and Aiden was getting out of his grandmother's car, she drove over here early so he could be here to manage the lights and go through the practice and make sure everything is right. It, it's not, there, there are so many pieces of this. When I pulled into the parking lot this morning, I like to try to be the first person here. I have a very hard time doing that. Even if I come super early, you know, uh, typically Greg and Kim, will, one of them will beat me here. Or, you know, and, and I feel like I've really achieved something if I beat all of them here, you know. But this morning, it wasn't just them. It was uh, Karen and various ones who get the coffee out, get the get this breakfast stuff together. You know, Jessica and Mylene and the different ones. They're all, they're, they're here. They're, they're doing stuff. They're making stuff happen. It, you know, and, and you go... You can, you can come in and just, we can just sometimes think all this stuff happens. It doesn't just happen. It's because somebody went and got the donkey. It's because somebody was willing to carry the scooper behind him. It's because someone was willing to talk the donkey into getting over there for Jesus. It's very, very critical to have all hands on deck. Next Sunday is Easter. And I'm going to tell you, even if you don't have an official job to do or whatever, come 30 minutes early and hang out. And just stand out in the parking lot and greet people and, 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 and tell people hi when they come in and do, you know, just, just have conversations with people. I'm just saying, do something. Do something. And even you being here is doing something because it adds a dynamic to the flavor, a flavor to the dynamic, I should say. And so people who were willing to work behind the scenes, who were willing to work hard, helped make what we call Palm Sunday possible. Oh, Jesus is a miracle maker. He could have, he could have created a donkey on the spot. I mean, you know, he could have done all kinds of things and not used anybody, but that's not how he works. God chooses to work through us, through his people. Number two, having a willing spirit of generosity. Having a willing spirit of generosity. Look at verse, start at verse 32, right where we left off. Let's read on down through. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Hey, why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. Now, th- there's a lot, I've you know, read a lot of different opinions about all the dynamics there. What I do know is, I do know that Mark recorded that the owners gave permission, and it certainly appears here they didn't try to stop them once they understood. And so it, there's a possibility Jesus had prearranged this with somebody. There's a possibility just in his foreknowledge of things that he actually knew there was a cult there. And, uh, that it, but it was a specific cult. It was a cult that had never been ridden before. And so uh, to, to think that one of those just like along the road up there, it could have very well been that just in his foreknowledge he knew that or he had arranged it ahead of time. But it does seem like this. Whenever they clarified and said, this is for the Lord, speaking of Jesus, and it referred in, in the way that they spoke that, it was uh, understood that they were speaking of Jesus Christ, um, that the Lord wanted, that they were willing to let him go, to let the donkey go. And, uh, and I think it's one of the other passages that basically says that uh, it was told to them that they would, it would be returned, maybe Matthew account, I can't remember which account it was, but they would actually return it as, but it would have been used as, uh, to, to be ridden on, uh, but they would return it. So I wonder who got that job. 
Speaking of, you know, like, hey, we're all in here. We're entering in Jerusalem. Jesus is turning the tables over now. He's doing this. Hey, by the way, you go take the donkey back. You know, maybe someone was thinking, it's getting a little wild in here. I'll be glad to take the donkey back. Or someone was thinking, man, I'm going to miss out on something. Stuff is really starting to rock. Something's starting to happen. And so, but somebody had to do it. So having a willing spirit of generosity. You know, to us, a donkey doesn't seem like a very big deal. But... How many times would you have a stranger come up to you? I mean, I'm talking about even if you kind of have a clunker, you know, and say, hey, I just need to borrow your car for a little while. I promise we'll bring it back. Most of us are like, yeah, right, you know, I'm sorry. It might look, it might look bad, but that's my transportation. You know, that's why it gets me back and forth to work. So it, it was a big deal that they were willing to let them use their donkey. They had that willingness. They had a generous spirit. They understood, somehow they understood enough that it was for Jesus, and either they knew enough about him or they trusted enough uh, about it to, 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 let him, to let it go. And, and here's just simply the question that I have, and that is this. Does Jesus have everything that's ours? Does he have it? Is it at his disposal or not? It's really a pretty simple answer. It's what we have at the disposal of Jesus or not. And so that's something we kind of have to grapple with. And I think in these people's situation, we see that they cared enough about their cult to say, hey, hey, hey wait a minute. Uh, why are you untying our cult there? What are you doing with that? And it seemed to be the awareness that Jesus was the one who wanted, that it made it okay for them to take the cult. And so everything that we are, everything that we have as believers really is God's. It belongs to him. We manage it. And so are we willing to give God permission so as to speak to have access to whatever is ours. Number three, having a worshipful heart that loves Jesus. Do you know hard work seems easy when it's done for love? If you uh, mow your yard and you're just thinking, why can't I afford to have somebody do my yard? Uh, this is ridiculous. This is hard. And I got a bad old mower and every, you, know, you start grumbling and complaining and going, this is ridiculous, you know, and uh, just feeling sorry for yourself. Or you can think, wow, I have a yard. Number one, I, I, I actually have some equipment to mow the yard. I have the physical capability of mowing the yard. I can make our place look better. I can make this a nicer place for my family. You know, isn't it amazing how we think about things, how it affects them? When we do something out of love, you know, basically, if you were to go on a mission trip with Woody, but you wouldn't allow your heart to love the people, love those children, it actually could be kind of a miserable experience for you. It might not be that good, you know, You might not come back and be crying like Woody would about him. You might be going, there's some snotty-nosed kids. They need to go home and take a bath. And they're like, you know, and they're, they're aggravating. They want to hang on you. They want to do, you know. You just come, you could come back with a bad attitude if you, if you didn't do it out of love. Because, because, you know, kids can be a nuisance. They can be a pain. They can be, uh, they can, you know, be a challenge. And so you, 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 when we do something out of love, it's like the oil to an engine, makes everything run smoother. It makes the you know, metal not rub against metal. It just is a whole lot better. Let's look at verses 35. Begin at verse 35. Pick up where we left off and go on down. So they brought the colt to Jesus, threw their coats on the colt, and put Jesus on it. 
As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. And as soon as he was approaching near the mount, descent of the Mount of Olives, which is the area where they're beginning to actually go right down into Jerusalem. As they were nearing the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. I'd kind of like for you to underline that phrase if you would. For all the miracles which they had seen. I'll come back to that in a moment. Shouting, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And that peace in heaven is an interesting phrase because we typically think of Jesus having come to earth that he's, we think peace on earth. We hear that phrase. He's the prince of peace. He, he Peace on earth. Here's, here's what I'm gonna, I, I don't know that I know fully what that means, but I think that only peace that we can experience here is the peace that comes, it's heavenly peace. And so Jesus represents that heavenly peace. Peace in heaven, whenever whenever his work is finalized on the cross, when his resurrection has occurred, then the peace of heaven is possible even for us. And so, so they're shouting these things. They're calling out. And uh, verse, verse 39 says, Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. Now, here's, here is what I think is critical for us to know and understand in this. And that is, this event was a God-exalting event. And God was going to be exalted whether people chose to do that or not. And I need to tell you, God is who he is, and he's going to be God whether you whether you embrace him or whether you don't. He's going to be honored whether you honor him or not. The question is, are we going to get in on some of the honoring? Now, there were some guys here who obviously were, were kind of resisting the spirit of worship that was occurring. They were not entering into the sense of worship. And the reason they were not entering into the worship is because they knew and understood for them to enter into that spirit of worship was saying that Jesus would, was God. We can't worship a man. We can't worship this person. We can't worship him. What was the basis that the people were worshiping him on? Because there are people that can worship all kinds of things. There are situations where people can just worship kind of randomly, wildly, whatever. They, could, you know, they can almost get it themselves. I mean, we, there's all kinds of religions, all kinds of ways that people worship or worship things, worship themselves, worship and even do it in, 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 in a sense of expression. That phrase that I ask you to underline, they were praising God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. They believed that only God had the power to perform those miracles. So they were acknowledging the fact that Jesus was God because he had the power to do things. So they were worshiping him because it had been revealed to them that he is not just a man. He is a man, but he is also God. He has the power of God at his disposal and he could do things that demonstrated it. And so they joyfully are shouting. And I just want to tell you, if you, you know, I actually believe if you love Jesus, uh, you can, you know, your, your heart is a worshipful heart wherever you are. If you really love Jesus and, uh, and, 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 you know, being together as we are on a Sunday morning and lifting up and singing worship is just an opportunity to, another opportunity to express that, uh, to, to let that out. It's a venue for us to, to let that worship out of our hearts, out of our lives. Um, and so in this scenario, these people were, were caught up in the worship of Jesus as the king, the Messiah, even though there were certainly those who probably didn't fully understand and comprehend that they understood and comprehended enough that he had done something that indicated he was God. He was not only man, but he was God. He had God power, God's power at work within him. And so they were 
exalting him, worshiping him as he entered into Jerusalem. And I don't know what drives you to have a worshiping heart, but I will tell you the greatest, the greatest is your love for Christ. I don't think there's anything else that will drive it more effectively than your love for Christ. Having a worshipful heart that loves Jesus. And I'll also tell you this, if you really love Jesus, and just even today, if you happen to bump into somebody here at church that you didn't really know well or anything else, and you happen to meet them and interact, it's easier to love people when you love Jesus. You know, I, I, I remember and told this story here some time ago, but uh, just like to repeat it. Some of you maybe repeat for others. It'd be your first time to hear it. But I had a young man who I, I had known actually most of his life. We'd grown up in the same uh, area. He was about six, six, seven years younger than I was. I was a, a young pastor in Kansas City. But he had uh, he wanted to do his internship with me, so he came out to Kansas City and spent the summer at our church doing his internship. And he's a very gifted young man, and uh, and and he was kind of like what you call cool. He was a cool guy. He was popular. He was well liked. He was a, he just he had a lot going for him, and a lot of capabilities, gifts, you know, uh, 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 skills. But he was still young and learning some things too. And uh, I remember forget at the end of a service, we were standing at the back greeting people as they came through. And there was this one person who stayed after everybody else left and got into kind of a lengthy conversation with us. And uh, I remember, um, I don't remember what the conversation was, but I just remember the scenario. And uh, anyway, eventually then he left. And so Steve and I were standing there together and... Uh, and just kind of wrapping up from the day or whatever. And he, he paused at one point and he looked at me. He goes, Rod, do you think that guy is weird? I said, well, I mean, he's probably, you know, maybe a little bit different or whatever, you know. He goes, you stood there and talked to him like, 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 he, like you didn't think he was weird or something, you know, or what and, and, uh, I said, well, I wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't, that wasn't what was on my mind. I was just listening to what he was saying. We were talking about it. He goes, man, I don't know if I can do this pastor and thing. If you've got to act like people are weird or okay, you know. I said, well, Steve, really, if you think about it, most people that don't think and act and look just like us, we have a tendency to think something's a little bit wrong with them, right? I mean, if you really, it's like people think differently, do something differently. You think, why do they do that? Why don't they do it like this? And I said, I will have to say this, if you're going to pastor people, the first thing you have to do is love people. Because if you don't love people, all you'll see is what's wrong with them rather than the value that they have. And I said, the second thing is you accept people for who they are, not for who you think they ought to be. And I said... You know, I could sit here and go, well, I, I definitely see some oddities in that person and that kind of thing. But if I focus on that, Steve, I have to quit pastoring because then all of a sudden I've classified that person as somebody that doesn't hold the same value as someone that I think is cooler. And I can't do that. Now, I w I'm not saying that to say this in the sense that, boy, I really have a whole thing all figured out and I'm so, you know, and, and that I really, he's, he was an idiot or something. It's just, a, it's, a, it's a, part of it is learning, but there's another part where there comes a point that we do the things we do for the right motives. And if we don't do them for the right motives, it'll wear thin on us pretty fast. I mean, most of the things you do as a parent in your home if you don't do it for love, whew, that's a job that is just too big to do out of total obligation. And I just want to say this too, loving people within the kingdom of God, it's too big of a job to do without the right motivation. Number four, and you have to write this whole one down, okay, this whole thing down, caring enough to weep for the lost. 
caring enough to weep for the lost. Look at verses 41 and 42. Now this kind of takes us where he actually was right at the door of Jerusalem. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. In this moment, it's kind of like Jerusalem, the children of Israel have kind of crossed the line. It's already in motion. Jesus is going to be killed. They're going to take his life. And he wept for the lost potential that they had in that moment to embrace, that the city had, the, 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 the leaders that be that had in that moment to receive God. He knew there was a rejection. He wept for them. And he wept for those who were broken and who were lost. And the hope of the world is at the threshold of their city, but they're not going to see it. They don't see it. And I, I don't know how to teach this. I don't know how to embed this into the spirit of each of us here. But I, I would like to ask you during this week of Holy Week to do three things. And you can look at it as assignment. Um, or you can look at it as an opportunity, uh, or you can look at it as a way to live out Palm Sunday effect going into the Holy Week. And the first request is this, and you, you can write this down however you want to, but beginning with today, put Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So from Sunday to Sunday, you know, you just want to put the first letter of the, of the day or whatever. Just list it down in a, on the back of your sheet. Put, a, put it there. Then to the right of that, put a heading above the word, the, the, the Sunday today. Put a heading above that and put Matthew. Just write the word Matthew. The book of, book of the Bible, Matthew. And then by today, write 21, Monday 22, Tuesday 23, all the way down to next Sunday being 28 and it will walk you through the events of the Holy Week. And so today, if you would make sure that you read Matthew 21, and it, it, it's about the same story. And then as it begins to detail, probably some things related to what Jesus did as he entered Jerusalem. Monday the 22nd, Monday, and Tuesday the 23rd, 24th, and on Sunday the 28th, you're gonna read about his resurrection. And I would request that you read that before you come to church next Sunday. Uh, go ahead and read the 28th. I, I know many of you have a Bible plan you already have, but I'm just going to ask you if you would just to, to include this in. I'm not asking you to do away with what the process you were, but do, just walk through Holy Week from the eyes of Matthew this week. The second thing is this I'm going to ask you to do. Is invite at least one person and probably not more than four people uh, to church next Sunday. And the reason I say not more than four, because you need to be able to relationally connect with the people that you invite. You know, you bring 15 people in, at least invest some, invite some of your friends to help you with that, okay? So that they don't feel like that you were just trying to, you know, win some prize by having the most people here on Easter or something, because we don't really do that kind of thing. Because we want, we're not about projects, we're not about even competition or those kinds of things. We're just simply about advancing the kingdom of God. And what we know is Easter is one of those Sundays that oftentimes people are receptive that might not be receptive otherwise. And so invite. You say, what happens if I don't? That's between you and God. You say, well, it would feel very unnatural to me. I'm an absolute introvert. Then just pray for people who are going to invite, okay? So I'm, I'm not trying to like force anybody's hands. I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to say on Easter Sunday, if you look at some of the chairs around you, say, if at all possible, I'm gonna invite somebody to come to fill one of those chairs for this Easter Sunday. The third thing that I'm gonna ask you to do is really the easiest thing to do. And that is show up on Easter Sunday. You know, 
we live in a world where, where there's a lot of movement, a lot of traveling, a lot of this and that. But, you know, spring break ends officially today. So be here next Sunday and help. If you have friends, you want to be here for them. Don't invite friends and then don't show up. You know, that'd be kind of bad. But if you invite friends and nobody, nobody shows, you can come and help be friendly to other people's friends who came. So show up and help those who have a visitor with them to have a positive experience. And I think as you go through, the, build some anticipation that Resurrection Day is going to be a red letter day, not just because it's a red letter on the calendar, but because the truth is Jesus is alive and we're going to celebrate that just to the best capability we have on that Sunday.